Yes, let's do that a little bit. Better, yeah, it's better. Good evening and welcome. This is John Harmon, founder, president, and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. We're delighted that you would join us this evening for a very important topic. And um, I'll come back to that in a moment and I'll introduce our special guest. But there's a few announcements I like to make as it relates to the organization, little organizational overview and upcoming activities that I would like to share with you all with the hopes that you would join us. Um, next slide. You know, through our mission, there's 1.2 million Blacks in New Jersey and over 88,000 Black um, businesses in our state. Um, black businesses uh, represent about you know, 93, I'm sorry, percent of Black businesses in New Jersey are sole proprietorships, which lend way to uh, a lot of opportunity to grow and expand and contribute to their growth and sustainability. We partner with the National Black Chamber and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to really get a better understanding of what's going on nationally as we drive economic empowerment and sustain the African-American communities and businesses through entrepreneurship and other capitalistic activities. Um, next slide, please. Um, next Saturday, right, November 5th, um, join us for this is season three of Pathway to Success, a television show which airs every um, first Saturday of the month on PBS, uh, NJTV, and um, Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield is one of our sponsors. We're going to have Neil Wilcox. He's head of corporate social responsibility for Pfizer, an organization that we have a great relationship with and looking to expand it. Next. Party with a Purpose, uh, November 15th down at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City from 3 to 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to be in the Brighton, Brighton room. And it's a great time of networking. But moreover, we've really laid out our, our agenda for the coming year, do a brief recap for um, last year, which will be this year. <laughs> for this year and really looking forward to next year. Wells Fargo kind of has been lead, the lead in this particular event. And it's a great time as we kick off the League of Municipalities uh, meetings for the next, I think that's over a three-day three, three day period in Atlantic City. And you get a chance to dance a little bit as well <laughs> and network. It's a fun time, but also a very serious time talking about our agenda and why it's important for you to get on board. Our last event of the year on December 8th from 6 to 9 p.m. at the APA Hotel in um, Island, New Jersey, our annual year-end meeting is going to take place there from um, 6 to 9 p.m. Kimberly Graham, Vice President of Diversity Initiatives for Nielsen, is our keynote speaker. Keynote uh, is probably uh, too formal of a term, but it's uh, she's going to do a, a presentation on Black consumer spend. Um, black spend projected at $1.8 trillion in the U.S. economy annually, probably about $1.4 to $1.6 right now. Um, a great networking opportunity. I would encourage you to be in the building on December the 8th, from 6 to 9 p.m. at the APA Hotel in Island, New Jersey. Register at aaccnj.com. June 15th, mark that date down. June 15th, 2023, Black Business Expo. 2023 Black Business Expo, a legacy of excellence. June 15th, from 9 to 6 p.m. at Montclair State University. This is our first event like this. And um, we partner with East West Connections, one of the most successful um, event planning organizations in the country. We're very excited, very talented group of folks led by Ralph Weaver, 
Their, their tagline is collaborate, communicate, and create. And we want to be right there with them and you on June 15th, 2023 at Montclair State University. Any questions this evening, put them in the q and A. I I know we have a live audience here on Facebook and um, we're looking forward to your questions as well. This is a very, very, very important topic that we're discussing this evening. Um, and we have joining us, Mr. Nicholas Kairos. He's uh, from Horizon, a Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And um, so Nicole, yeah, so if you can go to the next slide with Nicholas, uh, all his information. You know, behavior health is a topic that um, there's some stigma attached to it. Um, a lot of folks do not like to engage in conversations about behavioral health, but it's become so commonplace today. The conversations are a lot easier than they were before, but also, you know, it's great when you have a professional that can give you a full perspective on this topic. I'm not giving it any just do. I'm just, I'm just kind of teeing it up. But Nicholas Kairos is the guy that's going to share with us tonight. And I would encourage you, as you listen attentively, get your questions together. And we'd like to have an interactive session if we can. So, um, Dr. Kairos, we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity to present tonight. I'm honored to be here and thrilled to talk about this topic um, because it is an incredibly important topic and uh, one that I'm glad to help people become more aware of. Uh, so right now I'm sharing my screen. Um, let me just make sure, can you guys see the deck that I put there? Can you see that okay? That's good. Okay, great. Thanks so much. So let me start again. Uh, I only see the horizon though. though. Oops. Let me see. Um, okay, how about here? Is that, can you see that? Let me try this again. Sometimes this is a little tricky. So let me make sure I get this right. about that. Yeah, that's good. And if you go to like slideshow or- um, yep, I'm afraid it's gonna shift screen. So I have the problem with the, hold on, let me do this. Um, okay. Yep, give me one second here. Should be able to switch these real quick. Give me one second. I apologize. Well, I'm having uh, some technical difficulties. I think I'm just going to have to hold on. Let me try this. Or you could just do it from the way you had it. It just won't be full screen. I'm sorry. I don't. Well, I don't want to challenge any of our viewers here. Let me. Yeah, I'll try to get this going. Yeah, I apologize for that. I'm having a little trouble with the uh, full screen view. I can make this bigger though. Is that any better? That's good. Okay, let me go ahead from here. Um, so um, my name is Nick Karos. I am from Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Jersey, um, the behavioral health team. And I'm responsible for all the day-to-day -day operations for behavioral health at Horizon. I'm a, a licensed clinical social worker and I have my doctorate in social work. Um, and I've spent about half my career in direct practice, 
and worked in varying capacities. Uh, for example, child protective services, mobile crisis. I worked in hospital social work um, for a while and did some private practice. And then uh, the second half of my career, I've been working for um, companies like Horizon. Uh, so uh, again, it's an honor to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to present to this, this group and um, I'm excited to share some of the information I have tonight. So let me launch right into it. So first and foremost, we are really experiencing something of a national behavioral health care crisis. Um, so here's some quick facts. Uh, stigma is still very prevalent. I think one thing that um, COVID did was so many people were impacted by anxiety and depression that uh, it became uh, a marginally more um, available as a topic to people. I mean, people seem to be more open about talking about stigma. However, stigma is still very real and very impactful for people. And as we can see here, owing mostly to stigma, 67%, so that's almost 70% of people with a behavioral health condition who need help will never even ask because they're concerned about stigma, which is a, a staggering uh, concept. Uh, if you think about the same thing for, say, diabetes or heart disease, you're not going to have 70% of people who will not seek tre treatment because they're concerned about stigma around those illnesses. Um, over 120 million Americans live in a professional health area of shortage. So, you know, we see this tremendous demand. And then at the same time, we're seeing um, difficulty for people to access providers. We also know that people are struggling with basic needs, food, shelter, clothing, about 40%, which is another staggering number, um, but 40% of Americans are struggling to afford at least one of those basic needs. Um, and then we also know that there are many people, a high percentage of people also have comorbid complexities. So they might have a behavioral health issue, anxiety, depression, for example, and then they might have a major physical health issue like diabetes or COPD and heart disease. And this really compounds things. If you think about how challenging it is for some people to manage their diabetes to begin with, but if you're depressed on top of that, just getting out of bed can be a challenge, let alone going to the doctor, picking up your medicine, eating the way that they recommend that you do to improve your health outcomes. Um, so so um, this is uh, a um, a picture that becomes really complicated very fast. To bring this home to New Jersey, we can see that over a million people in New Jersey are um, have a, a mental illness. That's three times the population of Newark. Um, in 2021, February, just to be clear on the date of the data, but 42% of adults in New Jersey reported symptoms of anxiety or depression. 19%, 19.9, so that's 20% of those people were unable to get the help that they needed. And 39,000 people uh, in New Jersey live in a community that doesn't have enough mental health professionals to service their needs. So 72,000 New Jerseyans aged 12 to 17 have depression. Just as startling as we look at suicide, which is a, um, a really important topic for our society to tackle in general, but when we look at it as the second leading cause of death in New Jersey for young black men and women ages 15 to 24, the second leading cause. Um, and in 2018, there was a national study that said that black children between the ages of five and 12 were twice as likely to die by suicide than white children in the same age age bracket. And then I do feel compelled to make sure that I mention in here the 988 number. This is similar to 911 for emergencies. The 988 number was rolled out this year for people in crisis. And I just want to call out here, they actually, um, this is, they used to have the national suicide hotline. And what they did was they converted it to this three digit number because it's much easier to remember and it's quicker to access. Uh, and it's a national number, and they turned it into not just a suicide line, but a crisis line. So if you're having a crisis in general, 
Uh, they support mental health and substance use disorder crises and, and, and other kind of crises. So they called it the crisis line. So if you're in crisis, that's a, a generic number that you can use for those um, situations. The, when we think about what's happening in the market today, it, it's, a, it's a complex picture, right? So we have, um, sometimes there be what we consider a fragmented care delivery system. If you think about the number of specialists that somebody might be seeing at any given time, if you have a, an issue with your eye or you have a dental issue or you've got some, something going on with joints or COPD or heart disease, these all require different doctors. Um, so we're often getting treatment from different um, providers. Uh, and, and then there's also limited clinician access for, for many uh, specialties and, and longer wait times. It can also be confusing to navigate the healthcare system today. There's a lot of options, even looking at your insurance and figuring out what's my co-pay, what's my co-insurance, what's in network, what's out of network, where do I go for help? It can be very challenging uh, for, for people to, to figure out. And then it's hard, um, you know, HIPAA is a very important way that we protect people's privacy, but it also adds a level of complexity when you're trying to share documentation and coordinate treatment planning for individuals. And then there's other kinds of external forces that impact people receiving behavioral health treatment. So uh, stigma, again, people don't go. Uh, holistic care is something I'm gonna talk about a little bit more detail today because it's something that Horizon uh, has subscribed to. We actually um, revised our model of care to make sure that we were treating the whole person. And often what can happen is people's illnesses get treated uh, and not the person. And so when you think about the person, you wanna think about the totality of that individual and what's gonna help them improve their health outcomes. Uh, Horizon's mission is to empower people to achieve their best health. And the way that we do that is by looking at the total picture of the person and not taking apart their illnesses and treating them one at a time. Then also we know that there's a, a, still the opioid epidemic is still out there, COVID hit us. We have other problems that came up as a result of that, but please don't forget the, the people are suffering from opi opioid addictions and dealing with those challenges. And then of course, COVID did complicate things. And so some of this can, can lead to lower quality overall outcomes, looking at condition specific illnesses, treating illnesses and not people, uh, and a lack of coordination. And, and, and then this, this um, really impacts people. If you think about, I know that I have had times where I've even had to talk to my different providers and make sure that they discuss the treatment plan together so that they can bind their, their forces and really develop the more comprehensive plan than they may have individually in, in managing my own personal health. So integrated health is, is something that we are strong advocates for. And what we look to is to, to pull together health systems in the community, community providers, and the health plan as a pair to kind of pull this all together and drive looking at total individuals when we think about holistic care. So we like to treat people, not necessarily conditions. Um, so we we really worked towards building this innovative, more collaborative and comprehensive integrated um, program. And uh, we look to have improved health outcomes as a result. Individuals are happier with their experience. The providers are happier because they're more coordinated care and better outcomes. And then there's a more effective way to get care. Um, if you think about some of the confusion and misdiagnosis that happens, the more more we're able to coordinate care and have accurate, timely diagnoses and treatment, the better off um, people are, the, so they don't suffer as long uh, and, and the um, treatment is better. And so what this pulls together is behavioral health. Um, our team looks to pull together physical health, the pharmacy team, which is really an important part of people's treatment as they're getting pharma, pharmacy. Um, a lot of people take medications and making sure that that's coordinated with physical health and behavioral health. And then we look at the social determinants of health piece. And, the, and what that means is, again, that stuff, food, uh, shelter, clothing, uh, transportation, making sure that people have what they need to, 
to move on with their care. So one example of this is at Horizon, we really take special care with people when they're transitioning between levels of care. This is a time when people are very vulnerable. When they leave inpatient, let's say they were inpatient for mental health treatment, and they go to their next provider, whatever level of care it is. One thing we do is we call them, we make sure they have their transportation, they know where they're going, they have their appointment set up. We call their provider to make sure their provider's uh, ready for them. And then we call to make sure they showed up and that they saw their provider. And if they didn't, we offer to help them uh, remove any barriers to care to make sure that they can connect with that next level of care. And it's a, it's a really important part of treatment. Uh, this slide looks a little busy, so I'm going to kind of breeze through it very high level. But one of the things that we've done as we came into COVID and looking at all these problems, we increased the network to improve access. So we've got 8,000 providers. We've grown the network by 40 percent since 2020 to make sure people have access. And we added uh, virtual care options, which are incredibly important. When COVID shut everything down, telemedicine for behavioral health uh, went up by 80% as people wanted to access care at a greater rate, yet sometimes had fewer options with actually in-office care. So we augmented this with digital wellness tools, our website with trainings and topics available to them. Um, also, we did navigation. We help people with navigating the care, helping them understand their benefit, helping them find appointments, make sure they get to them. We have a care management program that offers wraparound service to help people with the, their total health needs. Uh, looking at, again, physical health, behavioral health, pharmacy, pulling that all together. We have a virtual therapy coaching program. Um, an integrated network. We're really big proponents of medicated assisted treatment, which allows people to get treatment in their community when they're suffering from opioid addiction. Um, and then we have an integrated system of care, which I'm going to touch on, which really works with providers in the community to have feet on the street to be able to visit people in their homes and help get them to appointments and to pull their providers together to do treat, treatment planning. And then we have a robust 24-7 um, peer support program as well. And then just, this is just a more graphic example of some of the virtual tools we put in place to address specialty areas like anxiety and depression, alcohol and substance use, just also just kind of generic emotional health and wellness and specialty programs we looked at for things like obsessive compulsive disorder and other kind of specialty areas. And then, as I mentioned, we have um, a host of community providers that we've partnered with to reduce some of this fragmentation to work with the physical health providers and behavioral health providers and, again, pulling the social determinants of health. And these are people that are in the community. We have high-risk individuals with complex comorbid issues that we are able to work with in a very meaningful way. And then Horizon, as a company, uh, works very closely with um, certain foundations in the community to make sure that we're um, able to help extend services to individuals. And then also for the group today, I have a, a, a pretty robust list of resources here that I, that I would like to be able to make available that I can send for distribution that might help people. Um, NAMI, National Alliance of, of Mental Illness in New Jersey is a very active um, group. SAMHSA is for substance uh, health and mental, mental health services. Here's the 988 number I mentioned before. Interestingly enough, on the state COVID website, they put a whole host of um, child and adolescent services for mental health there. So that's, a, that's got um, some, some really good services posted there. And then here's for ch a mobile outreach and case management for children and adolescents. Um, but, but I have several slides. Excuse me, Nate. Uh, options. Yeah. Can you go back to the slide with the Rutgers logo? Yes. Yeah. So these are the various partners you had. Yep. So the Quell Foundation is working towards reducing stigma in the community. They've done a lot of work in the community and they um, have worked also particularly close with uh, college campuses. That transition time. Uh, for individuals when they move to college can be very challenging and can exacerbate 
um, underlying illnesses people have from behavioral health issue. Mm -hmm. Also in the early twenties is when uh, people, if they have schizophrenia, they can have their first uh, psychotic break and to have that happen and be away from home is very challenging. So they've done a lot of great work. The Shatterproof is really working on um, addiction and helping identify high quality providers for people to access. The hub works on trauma trauma. It's a trauma program, a trauma center that helps people that have um, behavioral health trauma. Integrity Houses. Uh, I happen to also be on uh, disclosure here. I'm on the board of directors for Integrity House, and uh, they do an amazing job of substance use uh, and uh, Horizon's involved in supporting them. Gotcha. And, uh, well, the Rutgers Foundation. I wanted to, I know we're still going through the slides, but, you know, it jumped off the page. A couple of things you said. Secondly, is the leading cause of death is suicide. And you talked about the uptick of um, youth suicide. Yes. I mean, can, you know, is, is the um, social media, media triggering some of this stuff? Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, this is alarming here. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. And so... There's um, a lot of research around suicide. Suicide is a whole different area of specialization. I caution people to think that suicide is, um, is really only involved around depression. Su suicidology is a whole different science and there's a lot of impacting factors. This particular uh, statistic here, I thought I agree is very alarming. And um, some of the research around this suggests that there are um, some cultural nuances with respect to stigma that may prevent people from reaching out in general um, and leaving people feeling hopeless and helpless and without alternatives and uh, in incredible pain. And so, yeah, the quicker we're able to screen people individuals and identify who we can get assistance to, that is the, the way we'd like to go. But certainly, uh, you know, Horizon embraces zero suicide. There's a whole um, organization, Zero Suicide, that, that works on technology and other opportunities to reduce suicide in communities. Nick, thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. This is, you know, it's this impacts one in four, about four and a half Americans, you know, so it's a, it's a really challenging behavioral health is, is it's everywhere and it doesn't discriminate in any fashion against, the, you know, people regardless. Um, I do, I do believe that the, um, our society is becoming somewhat more tolerant. I'm seeing more and more high profile people. If you look at the courage that Simone Biles showed when she said, you know, I think my team's better off without me. I'm in so I'm so compromised right now. That's an incredible courage to be able to talk about that. Um, I'll also share, I, I'm, I'm an Eagles fan and uh, uh, they're currently undefeated, but I was never more proud of them than I was last year when one of their star linemen, Lane Johnson, during the season had to take off because he was having some uh, depression and mental health issues he needed to deal with. And he, he took three, three weeks off during the regular season and the, the team rallied around him and supported him in that. And so I think the more we're able to see high profile um, leaders, and, and um, people that uh, we, we see in the, in the media seeking help and talking about this openly, I, I think the better off we are. I mean, hopefully someday we will be able to eliminate this and people can talk about depression the same way they talk about diabetes. That, I mean, that exhausts my slides. I, I, I did, um, I'm available for questions though and uh, any other Curious that you'd like oh, to yeah, well, we got some questions for you. Okay. I, I right. tell you, this, this topic, I mean, it, you talk about suicide, you talk about trauma, particularly in urban settings, you know, with murders and violent, act, violent acts. It's almost people have gotten a little immune to it, um, numbness, if you will. I, I recall when I was a, a kid, when you mentioned uh, someone got shot or murdered in the community. It sends shock waves throughout the community. Now it's like, that's uh, somebody got shot last night. Um, can, you, can you talk about that? And then I have a specific question here as it relates to that. I'm just talking off the top of my head. 
Yeah, certainly. I think you're right. There is a cultural perspective and certain communities may react differently to this. However, from a behavioral health standpoint, we want to do as much as we can to eradicate um, cer certainly the impacts of behavioral health on individuals. Trauma-informed care is really a technology that has uh, taken hold. And it's a really important one because so many people have traumatic history that follows them, even intergenerational trauma. And so that impacts their day-to-day -day functioning and leads to potentially other more, more severe issues. And so we really need to, uh, as a society and, and really individuals, I mean, a lot of this has to do with behavior change. When we talk about creating a healthy population. It really starts with one person at a time and helping them make changes in their life that are going to improve their, their outcomes from behavioral health and health and physical health perspective, right? So that's, that's how we see improvement, one person at a time making changes in their life. And, and it, it's not easy though, right? How many times do we hear, eat right, get plenty of rest, mm -hmm. exercise, don't, you know, don't drink, don't smoke. And uh, these are these are difficult changes to implement. So let me get to the specific question. And, and it's uh, kind of related to what I said earlier, but it's probably put together a little more succinct than my rambling. And the question says, can you speak to the implications of precarious trauma in New Jersey urban, urban centers that may impact suicidal rates? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Yeah. Part. Yeah. So it says speak to the implications of precarious trauma in New Jersey urban centers that may impact suicidality rates. So, how can this trauma, uh, is there a correlation between the, the, er, the trauma in urban centers and suicidal rates? Certainly, um, you know, one of the hallmarks around people beginning to feel suicidal has to do with feeling helpless and hopeless. And um, that, that amount of pain from that, uh, for many people feels insurmountable. And so it, 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 trauma in, and violence impacts people in different ways. Not everybody um, perceives it or reacts to it the same way. But there are many people who have severe reactions to traumatic events that impact them and potentially can lead to mm. more drastic outcomes for them individually. I think the, my over, overriding point is if anybody even thinks they're having an issue around this, or if you're even asking yourself the question, or if you know somebody who's hurting, please reach out for help and help them get help. That's, I think, the most important thing. When you see that 67% of people who need help will never even ask for it, that's, I think, where we can make, as a community, our greatest impact by helping one another and reaching out. So there's a couple of questions here, and I'm going to go to the one uh, kind of most uh, closely related to what you just shared. I mean, some people don't know they need help, right? right. So the audience is asking, you know, what? are common signs that a person might need a mental health checkup. Yeah, I think there are some common things that we can think about. Certainly any um, changes that you would see in somebody, particularly isolating someone, if they begin isolating or withdrawing, they begin um, not talking to their friends. Uh, another um, sign of somebody who's contemplating this is if they are starting to give away things or settle their affairs. And the, mm. you can tell that they're, that's an indicator often that they're planning, planning something. But if you know someone and they really start isolating, I mean, even if they're not having suicidal thoughts, they could be hurting and in depression and having other kind of anxiety. Um, and, and I think just looking for changes in people's behavior and particularly ones that are more isolating or look like they're moving towards um, you know, giving away things and, and planning something. And the other thing is the, the concept of um, tap dancing around some of this doesn't necessarily work. I think that 
just asking people is probably the most effective way. People are surprisingly honest when they're hurting like this. And if you ask them, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Or another uh, phrase that people can use is, do, do you feel safe? And those are questions that can often help people start to talk about this. Well, um, well the pandemic, as you know, is a attributed to a, a lot more isolation, some because of um, health care, um, um, you know, guidance or uh, things that they put out as it relates to keeping yourself safe and and this social distancing, et cetera. Uh, is there any correlation in the impact in suicide rates from this following, um, you know, health protocols in, in communities? Yeah. Yep. You know, research aside, because people are going to be researching the impacts of the pandemic for years to come. But I think one of the things that we saw at Horizon, um, and just to give you an example of one of the ways that we tried to reach out and help people was, we saw started to see an increase in new starts for depression and anxiety medication. And so we saw that there was an increased frequency to the point where people went to their doctor. I mean, primary wow. care doctors are often behavioral health providers of default. A lot of people that don't want to go to a therapist or a psychiatrist or some a behavioral health specialist will go to their primary care doctor and say, I think I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I'm having, I, I need some help. If, if you pay, if your, your doctor should be doing a screening every year and asking you, have you about some signs of depression. And so we try to capture it there, but we definitely saw the incidence of um, depression and anxiety and suicide definitely went up uh, as did substance use um, and, and other kinds of, of illnesses. Um, but yeah, the, the primary care doctors are a tremendous um, provider of behavioral. So some, do some doctors prescribe more psychotropic medicines than they do antibiotics. So uh, well, well, given given that Nick, the the, the stigma, of suicide and trauma, are, are clearly factors in one's lives. How do we make a you know a quantum leap in promoting people seeking help? You gave an example of two prominent um, athletes. Um, how do we encourage more of that? And if, and by doing so, um, you know. What are the what do you think is better for society, uh, et cetera? Your thoughts around that? Very curious. I I I do think that the so I want to thank you again for having me here tonight. I think this is one of the ways which we start to open the discussion and combat this silent, in many ways, my mind, many ways, that's it's one of the silent killers. And so the more that we're able to talk openly and recognize some of the signs and symptoms, like people isolating, a loss of interest uh, in their day-to-day -day activities, fatigue, sleeping often, people seem more anxious than before, irritability, changes in weight and appetite. These are some of the things that can give you a sign that somebody might be struggling with something. I think being in touch with your friends, family, loved ones that you um, you think you can identify any of these changes in and, and having open discussions about it. And the more that we have forums like this, and like you said, we see athletes and um, entertainers uh, coming out and talking pretty openly about this, it's, it's going to hopefully, the goal is then to reduce the stigma so people can talk about it even more openly. So can you talk about PTSD, um, what are some of the triggers? So that's a very relative question. So post-traumatic stress disorder, as it implies, is post a traumatic incident. So a traumatic mm -hmm. incident happens that impacts somebody. And then often the triggers that somebody might have are related to their initial um, incident. So that's why you see so often with the veterans who have had combat related um, trauma, then certain uh, um, elements when they're back in society can trigger that like a, a car backfiring um, might sound like a weapon and, and right. trigger them. But oh, it, wow. it really depends on what the incident was uh, that triggered the initial event will then trigger the concurrent traumas as well. Wow. Well, I tell you, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. The fact that uh, 
we're a business organization, and we're having a conversation about uh, about you know behavior health. I think it, it tells you we've come a long ways. <laughs> we've kind of evolved here, and um, but it's it's interesting because uh, we could all look at ourselves and our family and our friends, and um, it's 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 pretty visible in our daily interactions. Yeah, I, I would I would say that statistically. Everybody on this call probably knows someone or is related to one or they themselves have struggled with some kind of behavioral health or substance use issue. I mean, if you think about one in four to five people, anytime you have a gathering of, of that many people, you know there's some people that are impacted. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. I'm just thinking now, you know, we, we talk about the social determinants of health, you know, in terms of uh, the, the, the quality of someone's living space. Uh, do they have adequate transportation to get to and from work? Um, the quality of the food that they consume. Um, could, could the whole um, behavior help be a part of that whole continuum? Absolutely. That's why we, when we look at individuals, we'll look at the total person. You never know what somebody is struggling with. It's really important not to try to judge people and to, you know, it's the old like walk a mile in my shoes uh, if you really want to understand what's happening with me. So that's why it's important to watch for these signs and symptoms and be willing to reach out to somebody if you think they're struggling. I mean, it, it's so important that we as a community take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about the growth of digital wellness, that, that platform. Um, could you speak to what might be um, contributing to that? I'm thinking people want a little more privacy in their, their conversations or, you know, talk to me. What, what do you think is fueling the growth in that area? So it's interesting. There's been a fair amount of research in this area, and they're still working to understand it because it's relatively new as technologies go. However, interestingly enough, there are some generational differences. There are some generations that are more tech savvy than others. And mm -hmm. so we do see some penetration, more penetration for digital services among um, young people who are have grown up with a cell phone in their hand. Uh, and, and interesting, you're right, that, you know, as we think about stigmas, some people actually feel like they can be more honest when they're um, doing some kind of telemedicine, particularly there's, there's texting therapy. There's also online um, computer generated therapy and, mm. gener and, and so you're interacting with the computer and some people actually prefer that because they feel like they're not um, disclosing to another person. Well, it's um, like but, yeah, there's like a theory. Yeah, yeah. A theory. Yeah, so there's an opportunity to be more open ah. and honest than people think. Other people love to have the in, per, in person. And so, you know, we have seen some people returning to brick and mortar office treatment. Um, but but really, the telemedicine looks like it's here to stay there. There's such an uh, in, in so many people embracing that technology. Wow. And it's convenient, you know. No, absolutely. Uh, let me reach out to our folks. Any more thoughts or questions out there? Um, because this has been a great... <laughs> One hand is enlightening, and, and on the other hand, it's a little scary um, to see yes. um, that this is one of the leading causes of um, of death. And you know, what's even more shocking, young people. Yes. Um, oh, Mr. Harmon, there's a question from Facebook. I put it in the chat for you. All right. Let me see. All right. Let me grab this one here. What are your thoughts about the apps? that address health care. So are we talking about like the telemed, like we were just talking about? The well, yeah, maybe the ability to just go on your cell phone and pull up something and start to ha ha have some interaction with some individuals that may have a solution. Yep, some people really embrace that technology and it can be very effective. But again, as with many things, it's important to have a good match, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody has to be open to that technology and be willing to use it. The other thing I would say is there is, there's a lot of them, right? And mm -hmm. so I know one of the things that um, we've done at Horizon is over the past two year, 
two years, we have vetted and talked with about 400 of these providers to make sure that they have integrity around the clinical mm -hmm. part of it, mm -hmm. right? Because it's really important to make sure you have a solid uh, provider on the other end and that they're doing evidence-based care and they have rigorous adherence to principles and and, and the, the, the things. Yeah, that and I think that's probably the point of where, where the question was coming from. How credible are these sources? Who, who does a kind of an assessment of their value um, because people are very vulnerable in these situations and they yeah. uh, get tapped into someone or some source that may not be uh, serving their best interests can make the situation um, worse. So I think that was probably in part the nature of that question. In yeah. terms of, go ahead. I'm glad to, I, I, I would like to relay to you or get to your organization that list of, of resources that are available out there. These are credible resources that are available to help. And then I would also advise people to always, if, if you have insurance, check uh, with your insurance company because uh, I know at Horizon and I believe at other companies, they do, they take great care to vet these providers to make sure you have the highest quality evidence-based providers. So um, your insurance company is there to help you with that and, and help guide you through the process. So there's, there's a question that came from Facebook as it relates to, you know, the time change. Clocks being set back, clocks being set forward. Um, balancing that transition, this, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, that's a real struggle for people. So uh, in the extreme, uh, some people st suffer from what they call seasonal affective disorder. And that 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 really creates a level of depression for people. Um, and, and, it, and it is. I mean, I can certainly appreciate that myself. I, I when you when you get up and it's dark and you go to work and you come home and it's dark, it, 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 it can it can impact you. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say if you start to see some of these things happening to you that we mentioned before, isolating um, yourself, being more irritable, um, having some anxiety or depression, difficulty sleeping, if you feel like it's impacting you from a symptomatic perspective, then please reach out for help there. There's help out there for that because it, it can be pretty profound for some people. You know, when you started to give your response to the question, it took me back to, you know, the Northwest Seattle. Uh, you know, there used to be talk about uh, a lot of suicide rates because of the the, the yeah, weather. Starting, yeah. You know, yeah. and I'm yeah. thinking Alaska as well. Um, is, is there data on that, that as well as it relates to um, you know, parts of the country where daylight is short in short supply or extended you know, darkness? That's a great question. I'm not well versed on that on the top of my head, but I'd be glad to look into that and get back to you. Yeah, I mean, all right, here we go. How do we as employers mitigate these issues for team members who may have these challenges? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is early identification, screening. I encourage everybody when you go to your primary care doctor, if they're asking you those questions, to be honest. Um, and and so, and then a lot of schools, uh, in fact, I have a resource that the uh, state has put through the school system to look at screening individuals and, and helping them get care. But I, I think that's the important thing, right? We have to be able to identify people who need help and reach out to them quickly because we know the majority of people won't ask for help. Well, you know, I found the presentation, as I said earlier, uh, a little frightening, but also enlightening. And uh, the, um, the sharing, of um, this information I think is, is so important because we go to life and take a lot for granted um, that everyone is in a good place. And so now you've um, got me to think a little more to look beneath the smile and see if you can really discern if everything really is okay versus what someone just has articulated or expressed. 
Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to present today. And I think the more that your group and groups like this are embracing this content and being able to share it with as many people as possible, it's, it's, it's important work. And, and I really appreciate you, you having the, the vision to, to have me on tonight. Thank you. Well, I think Horizon, I don't think, I know they've been an amazing partner of the chamber and our ability to leverage uh, our relationship for mutual benefit is what it's all about. They've afforded us access to people like yourself, access to the inner workings of their organization's best practices, all of which we seek to share with our members, our constituency and communities where we live and work. And it's, um, it, it, it's helpful for society as a whole. Oh, there's another question, is burnout? <laughs> a symptom of mental health concern. Well, maybe this well, time or not. I, ju I just want to offer, this doesn't have to be one and done. We'd be glad to come back and focus on suicide or depression or anxiety and do a more focused presentation if you would find that helpful. Okay, well, good. Well, we're going to give you a little time back tonight. This was a great engagement and um, we thank you for taking the time and, and, and preparing this information to share with our folks. Until the next time, you be well, and um, I will sure to tell and thank the folks at Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield of New Jersey for allowing us to have an opportunity to be with you this evening. Thank you again for your time. All right. Have a good night. Good night.